morning. I've already read the text that we're going to be looking at, so let's go ahead and dive into this. And let me just again review what it is we see going on as, as Luke is uh, recording for us, not what he was an eyewitness to, but what he had gleaned from interviewing several eyewitnesses to what it is that Jesus, uh, in this case, began to do and teach um, from the time that uh, he came into the world uh, and began his ministry to the time when he left. And, of course, the book of Acts continues that work through his disciples, even as he's continuing that work through us today. But what he's shown us um, so far is uh, several different glimpses into the authority that our Lord Jesus Christ has. We saw that he has authority over the devil, that when he was tempted by him in the wilderness, he was able to overcome him. He could even command him, and the devil had to obey. Be gone, Satan, and the devil left him, at least until an opportune time. And we know that comes when uh, Jesus is handed over to his enemies. That Jesus has authority over his own life, even though those in the synagogue in Nazareth wanted to kill him by throwing him down the cliff. Because he was claiming to be the Messiah, Jesus was able to walk right through the middle of them and leave because no one could take his life away from him until he was ready to lay it down. We saw his authority in the word as he was uh, preaching in the synagogues. Those who heard him realized that um, he had uh, a kind of authority that they didn't see in the Pharisees and in the scribes that no one ever spoke the way he speaks with such wisdom, such power, and such clarity. We saw Jesus' authority over the demons, that they can't resist him either. And of course, that's not surprising, considering he overcame their captain and their king, the devil. They were afraid of him when they saw him. They pled with him not to destroy him, because they knew one day Jesus, as a matter of fact, is going to do that when he condemns them to the lake of fire for good because of their evil. We see that Jesus also has authority over sickness. He's able to command sickness, and it obeys him as well. We saw his authority over the creation, the first example being uh, his authority over the fish in the sea. When he told Peter and Andrew and James and John to go out and let down their nets, even though they had fished all night and caught nothing, they were willing to do it because it was Jesus who told them to do it. And when they cast the nets, Jesus commanded the fish to fill the nets, and they did fill the nets to the point where they were breaking and the boats until they were sinking. And then we saw Jesus' authority over men. Remember, he called his first four disciples. And they immediately left everything. And they began to follow him. By the way, that is the response that we are to give to the Lord Jesus when he calls us by the gospel, that we are to give everything. Not necessarily give up all the possessions, but to realize they belong to him. And that he can use them and use us for whatever reason he desires. Now this morning, we see an even clearer demonstration of who Jesus is as he exercises authority over sin. Now it might be argued that, that God has given authority to do various miracles to his prophets and uh, you know, throughout history, and certainly Jesus will transfer that authority to his apostles to perform miracles, and uh, there are others who do these things, but there is no one who can forgive sins, but God alone. And that's what we see this morning. Jesus does, and that reminds us who he is. Now, what we want to look at are really two things. First of all, we want to see him healing the leper, and secondly, his healing the paralytic. And the reason why I group these together is because I do believe that the leper gives us a, a, a marvelous, gruesome illustration of what it is that we look like to the Lord outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, but God's mercy in his willingness to reach out to us and to cleanse us from our sins, which we see more explicitly in the example of the paralytic. Now, first of all, we see him heal the leper. Uh, Luke doesn't tell us exactly where this takes place. He says it's basically in one of the cities, but Mark tells us it's in one of the cities in Galilee. And we do need to realize that there was a difference between Jesus' ministry in Galilee and his ministry in Judea. Galilee was much more open uh, to Jesus, uh, his preaching and his miracles. He was able to do more there. Uh, he tended to uh, rub those in Judea the wrong way because he was pushing, as it were, the, the envelope with those people. So that when he would show up in Jerusalem, and we see that mainly in John, 
they wanted to kill him every time they saw him. But these are the days of Jesus' popularity, and he is free to minister in Galilee, and they're very, very excited about it. But while he was in one of these cities teaching, he saw, or actually, a man who was covered with leprosy saw him. Now, I think those of us who particularly uh, are phobic towards germs have probably looked a little bit into leprosy. We've come in contact with it at some time, at least the idea of it, uh, in, in our past and have wanted to know a little bit more about it. We do know that leprosy is a very terrible disease. As a matter of fact, one time, I don't know why, but I, was, uh, I came across this uh, Highway Patrol magazine of all things, and it had a picture of a migrant worker who was out in the field picking, and he was covered with leprosy. And I was thinking, oh, you know, it may be getting a little bit closer to home than we think. But thankfully, leprosy is curable. Okay, now this was several years ago. Leprosy is, is curable, but in those days, it was not curable. They didn't really know what caused it, although sometimes it was caused as an act of judgment, uh, for sin. I mean, the Lord struck Miriam on one occasion with leprosy. Uh, on uh, another occasion, uh, he struck uh, Elisha's servant, Gehazi, because of his greediness with leprosy. One time, Uzziah, when he went into the temple doing something he shouldn't be doing, leprosy broke out on him. Sometimes it was judgment for sin, but not always. They didn't know how people necessarily got it, but they did know that it was infectious and so they avoided touching people who had it. Now today we know that this disease is spread through a cough or a sneeze from somebody who's infected or multiple contacts with infected skin. We know it progresses very slowly that if you become infected with it, you may not show any symptoms for up to five years. It has a five-year incubation period, sometimes upwards to 20 years, so that it makes it difficult to know where a person actually came in contact with it, where the infection took place. The bacteria targets specific areas in the body. One thing we know quite clearly, it affects the skin, causes discoloration. Ulcers break out sores that do not heal. Uh, in some cases, with some forms of leprosy, large nodules, basically lumps and bumps, uh, begin to form on the body. And in severe cases, it causes deformity and disfigurement because the disease is literally rotting the flesh away from the bones. It affects the mucous membranes, you know, the, the, the moist areas of the body causing uh, nose congestion, uh, nosebleeds, redness around the eyes, and of course blindness. And it affects the nerves. As nerves become inflamed, uh, they ex you experience a burning sensation and then a, a numbness and then a, a muscle weakness, and eventually there's paralysis. Now, leprosy in the Bible describes a fairly um, broad range of, of skin problems and, and various other types of infections, even in, in walls, but it also includes this disease that we're familiar with today. Now, in the Old Testament, as you can imagine, when a person was diagnosed with leprosy, they immediately became a social outcast. Uh, they couldn't stay in the camp when Israel was in the wilderness. Lepers were put outside the camp. When Miriam was struck with leprosy, she had to go outside the camp. She was unclean uh, until she was made clean again. And that was the case in order to avoid infecting others. When uh, Israel finally entered into Palestine, lepers were allowed to be in the city if the city didn't have walls. But if it did have walls, they couldn't live in the city. They had to remain outside the city, which is why we find the four lepers uh, in the case of the uh, Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel during the time of the divided monarchy when the Arameans had besieged the city. The four lepers were sitting in the entrance of the gate. They could not go in the city, but of course, to go away from the gates of the city, they would possibly be killed by the Arameans. But the point is they couldn't live within the walled cities. Uh, being in the city, if they met somebody on the street, they were required to cry out, unclean, so that the people would know to avoid them, and also so that no one would make the mistake of giving them the customary greeting, which was not shaking hands, but essentially they would embrace one another. 
And uh, obviously, if you did that with a leper, it could be um, somewhat dangerous. You would immediately become unclean and under observation. But knowing this was the case, I think we can understand something of the plight of this man and why he responded to Jesus the way that he did uh, and the significance of Jesus' response to him. When he saw Jesus, he didn't cry out unclean, but realizing that Jesus was the only one who might possibly be able to heal him. As a matter of fact, he believed he could. He cried out, he fell on his face, and he begged for mercy. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And actually, this leper exhibits a little bit more than just, um, you know, the, the expression that the Lord might have mercy on him. Uh, he also expressed his faith in the Lord Jesus. He believed that Jesus could heal him. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And we should also notice here how Jesus responds. He didn't just simply tell him, okay, I'm willing, go to the priest, show yourself to the priest. That's what he's going to do later with the ten lepers who come to him. They're going to say the same thing. And Jesus is going to say, go show yourselves to the priest and basically offer the offering to them. In this case, Jesus does what nobody else would have ever dared to do, and I don't think any of us certainly would have in, in this case. He stretched out his hand in compassion, and he touched the leper. Nobody would ever touch the leper because of the possibility of contamination, but Jesus reached out and touched him, and he said, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately, the leper was healed. And we can hardly imagine what this guy was going through, being, having his body eaten away and being a social outcast for so long. Suddenly, somebody touches him. This is Jesus showing compassion. He's made whole. He no longer has to be an outcast. Perhaps he was even separated from his family. Now he can rejoin them. Now he can rejoin society. But more importantly, now he can go and worship God because a leper also could not go into the temple and could not worship the Lord. Well, the man was healed, and then Jesus did something that was interesting. He ordered him not to tell anyone, but rather to go and show himself to the priest, the same thing he's going to say to the ten lepers when he heals them, because the priest, his job, his responsibility was essentially that of determining whether a person was clean or unclean, whether they could come into the assembly or had to be excluded from the assembly. The priest had to examine him to see whether or not he was actually uh, clean. So that was one of the reasons why he had to go there. But he also was required to offer the sacrifice the Lord required through Moses. Now, again, there's several reasons why Jesus wanted him to do this, uh, not the least of which, of course, it was the priest's responsibility to examine him. But I think Jesus did this also with a, with a sort of a larger principle, is that God has had mercy on you. Now I want you to go and obey him. Okay, the law of God requires that you go to the priest, and so I want you to go. But secondly, Jesus did this because he wanted this to be a testimony. He, uh, Luke says, to them, as a testimony to them. Well, to, who are the them? The priests, certainly, because how often do they see a person who's actually healed of leprosy come, and how was this person healed? The priest would undoubtedly ask him, how did this happen? Jesus touched me, and he healed me. Or it could just simply be the people in general. The Lord wanted to give the people and the priests a, a testimony that they could not refute. So go to the priest and uh, be pronounced clean and, and provide this offering. You know, show your thankfulness and provide this testimony. Now, the interesting thing here is that the man, and I don't think rebelliously, although there is a, certainly a, a degree of rebellion here, he didn't obey Jesus. We, we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 45, in a parallel passage, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in un unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. And then Luke writes this in our text, but the news about him was spreading even farther and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray.
Um, again, I don't know that the person was, you know, trying to be rebellious, but um, I think what he wanted to do uh, was tell other people what Jesus had done for him, right? I mean, when something of this magnitude takes place, you want to tell other people what it is that this one whom you're so thankful for and, and, and to has done. And certainly, as we think about how this applies to forgiveness, we, we ought to do uh, the same thing, ought to be willing to do the same thing. Now, the cleansing of this leper, I think, serves as a picture of our main point. And the main point is what we see next in the healing of the paralytic. Because leprosy essentially does to the body what sin does to the soul. Uh, sin makes us spiritual lepers in the sight of God. And again, only Jesus can heal that. Jesus heals not only the body, but he also heals the soul. So next we see the healing of the paralytic. Luke tells us that one day when Jesus was teaching, uh, among those who had gathered to listen to him were some Pharisees and teachers of the law, the scribes, from the villages of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. He was still in Galilee. We learn from the other Gospels that this particular incident of the paralytic actually took place in Capernaum. It took place at Jesus' home. It took place in Peter's house. And we read about them going up on the roof and taking the tiles apart and making this huge hole and lowering the guy in. They were doing that to Peter's home, okay? That's something maybe that, um, it's just sort of an interesting point. But again, uh, on this particular occasion, we read, the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Now, it's an interesting thing that, that Luke should say this. Wasn't it always the case that the power of the Lord was present? If Jesus is present, isn't the power of the Lord also present to heal? Well, apparently, that wasn't the case. In Scripture, we find in, in the, the Gospels, where there was little faith, there was little power. There was one time when Jesus came to Nazareth, and we read in Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, He could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. Where there was little faith, there was little power. But where there was great faith, there was great power going forth from Jesus. Uh, when Jesus saw the faith of the centurion, remember, who came out to Jesus on behalf of his servant, uh, he marveled, we read in, in Matthew 8, verse 10, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And then he said to the centurion, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed from that very moment. I think this reminds us that if we want to see the Lord work with great power, if we, you know, uh, desire to see this, if we are to see it take place, we need to have a great faith. We need to have a strong faith. Sometimes we don't receive the things we ask because, as James tells us, we ask doubting. And if we ask doubting, James tells us we shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Sometimes, you know, it wasn't the Lord that was lacking power, but it was a lack of faith on those who were to receive the, the benefits of that power. They just didn't believe that Jesus was able to do it. Well, on this particular occasion, the power of the Lord was present because there was faith that was present. While Jesus was teaching, we read that some men, and Mark tells us there were four of them, and this makes sense, a stretcher carried by four men. Uh, they came carrying a paralytic, a man who was paralyzed, he couldn't move his limbs, and they were bringing him to Jesus in order that he might heal them. Now, when they couldn't reach him, because of the crowd, they climbed up on the roof, they opened the tiles of Peter's home, and they lowered the man on the stretcher until it was in front of Jesus. Now, Luke tells us that when Jesus saw their faith, and again, let's remember, he's not talking so much about the four men, though the four men had faith, they carried the man to Jesus to be healed, but also the man on the stretcher. When he saw their faith, he didn't heal uh, the man. At least they, he didn't heal them right away. But instead, he said this, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, he said that because his sins were forgiven, because he had faith 
because he had trusted Jesus savingly. That's the only way your sins can be forgiven is if you're trusting the Lord Jesus. But he said that also because he wanted to teach the crowd who had gathered around him something. Now, when Jesus said that, the scribes and the Pharisees immediately thought this man had blasphemed. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, you know, they were right about that. Only God can forgive sins. Only he can forgive any offense that has been committed against him. But they were wrong in thinking that Jesus had blasphemed because he is the Son of God, because he has this authority. Now, again, Jesus knew what, what they were thinking. As a matter of fact, this is what Jesus wanted them to think. He wanted them to ask the question because he was going to answer this question. But instead of arguing with them over whether or not he had this authority because it could turn into, yes, I can, no, you can't kind of thing, Jesus had determined to show them this authority by healing the man. So then Jesus asked them this question in verse 23. Which is easier, to say your sins have been forgiven you or to say get up and walk? Well, you know what? Uh, when you think about it, it's a whole lot easier. You, it's easy to say either. But how do you prove either? If you say your sins are forgiven you, how can you prove that that's actually taken place because nobody can see the difference? That's something that is only seen in heaven. But if you say get up and walk, everyone will immediately know whether or not you have the authority to do what you just said. And so that they would know that Jesus has this authority to forgive. He said to the paralytic, in verses 24 through 26. I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. When the Lord has mercy on us, the right response is to give him glory. Give him credit. Give him the honor for the healing. Give him honor for the forgiveness or for whatever mercy he gives they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. Remember when the Lord exerts His power and you realize who it is that's standing before you, and you realize this one is the Holy God, it evokes a kind of fear, a kind of terror, a dread, especially if you're outside of Christ, a fear of the Lord. And that's what we see here. But again, the important point is this. Jesus proved by what he did because God would never give anyone the ability to do miracles, even, even those who didn't have the authority to forgive sins. He would never give anybody the ability to do these miracles who would lie, okay? God would only endorse the truth. That was the purpose of the miracle, wasn't it? It was to prove that you were from God. It was to make people stop and be afraid and pay attention so that then a, you could communicate with them a message from God and the miracle would prove that you actually are that messenger from God. So he wouldn't endorse a lie. This miracle proved that Jesus actually can forgive. So, so why is that important? Well, again, think about this. Uh, what is the greatest danger to the human race? What was our greatest danger when we were outside of Christ? The danger is sin. Okay, the danger is that being guilty before the Lord, we would ultimately be destroyed in God's judgment, in the judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ, since all judgment has been entrusted to Him, if it weren't for this very important but simple fact that Jesus can forgive sins. Remember that when we came into the world, as well as everybody else into the, in the world, we came into the world guilty. We were guilty enough for God to condemn us then. Paul writes in Romans 5.18, through one transgression, that is the sin of Adam, there resulted condemnation to all men. All men are condemned because of Adam's sin. And after we came into the world, every single day we added to the guilt of that one sin with our hatred against God, with our breaking of His commandments. We never loved God 
as we should. We didn't love him at all. We had no love for God. And that's the reason why we never obeyed him as, as we should. The only reason why we obey him now as believers is because we have the Spirit of God in us who produces love for God and we want to honor him and we want to praise him. Now, sometimes we tend to think that maybe we really weren't all that bad. I mean, maybe we just fell a little bit short and Jesus had to make up the difference. But God, who, who sees the heart and knows the truth of these things, could see the corruption in our souls. And we do need to realize that to him, we appeared not as uh, those clothed in righteousness, basically acceptable to him, but rather we appeared as spiritual lepers. Our souls looked to him as a leper who is covered with leprosy would look to us as deformed, as diseased, as basically a corpse that is rotting. That's what lepers look like, sadly. And so God treated us that way and would have continued to treat us that way for all eternity as outcasts. We could not be in the presence of God, even as the lepers could not be in the presence of healthy people because of well, because of its uncleanness, God cannot, He is too holy, He is too pure to look upon evil. And that would have been our situation for all eternity if it were not for His Son, the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the only reason the Father can forgive us, His obedience. We need that perfect righteousness, His death. We need that payment for our sins. And Jesus is the only one who could have paid for those sins. He is the only one, of course, who has because he is God. And again, this is what the table reminds us of this morning. So because of what Jesus Christ has done, even though we were lepers in the eyes of the Lord, he was willing to reach out and touch us in his mercy. He was willing to take away our uncleanness. He was willing to make us acceptable in His Son because, again, by His grace, He sent His Holy Spirit into our hearts and gave to us the new birth so that we could look to Jesus and we could be saved. So again, I think what we see here in the case of, of the leper is an example of God's mercy to us. He has, in the same way as He did to the leper, taken away all this uncleanness and our response to Him should be what it was uh, of the, the leper and of the paralytic, giving glory to God, giving him the honor and the credit. That's really what is to be a part of our testimony as we tell others about what the Lord has done for us. And we should, out of thankfulness, serve the Lord in obedience. When Jesus told the, uh, the leper to go, he left. He should have gone all the way in order to, uh, to do what the, uh, what the Lord called him to do. But the point is still the same. He doesn't exonerate us from obedience, but rather he gives us the power to obey him. And again, so that we don't make a mistake and think that somehow obedience is legalism, we need to remember we don't obey so that God will show us mercy. We don't obey so that God will save us. We don't obey so that God will keep us uh, clean and, and in his grace so that we can continue to, to go to heaven. God saves us in His mercy. He reaches out in His grace and He touches us. He cleans us. He brings us into His family and He makes us His sons and His daughters forever. And then He tells us, out of thankfulness for all that I've done for you, I want you to obey me. And I want you to obey me because that's what my son did. And I want you to obey me because it's right. And I want you to obey me because this is the very definition of love. I want you to obey me so that others can come to know me as well. He wants us, as we saw again on Wednesday, he wants us in response to worship him. And worship is giving him glory. It is obeying him. It is meeting together as, uh, on Sundays and, and worshiping the Lord and giving him glory. It is walking with him throughout the week and honoring him in everything we do and in all of our choices of what we say and what we think and what we do and what we desire. We are to be becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he gave us his spirit, so that he might work that image within us. So because of what Jesus Christ has done, the Lord is able to reach out to us in mercy. He is able to cleanse us, and we are to worship him. Let me just close by saying this. If, if there's anyone here this morning who has never done this, 
who has never reached out and looked to the Lord, look to Jesus now. You need to remember, Jesus is the only one who can do anything about that situation. As long as you are in your uncleanness, as long as you are guilty of sin, you're still in danger of judgment, and we don't know when that judgment is going to fall. The Bible tells us that God is pouring out His wrath every single day upon the wicked. It's not something that is reserved for the day of judgment. And once that day comes, it's too late to do anything about it. You have to look to Jesus now. You need to ask for His mercy now. You need to turn from your sins and trust Him now. But you can be guaranteed this, that if you do that, He will reach out in His mercy and He will cleanse you. As a matter of fact, He's already reached out to you in His mercy if you're willing to look to Him and trust in Him because you need His grace even to do that. Well, may the Lord grant His mercy to each one of us and may He help us to, to hear what it is we need to hear from this passage this morning. Let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, apply this to us And let's also ask him to prepare us to come to the table.